everybody. It's uh, good to be with you again today. It's good to have you with me. Uh, in these uh, studies with Bob, this is uh, episode 14, and we will have probably three, maybe four left uh, to go when we, as we travel through the book of Ephesians. Uh, the uh, brothers who have handled me here um, have asked me to continue in some way after I finish, and we uh, I think probably what will the next study will be will be a great moments or great events of the Bible. And we'll look at some of the highlights, like, of course, the creation, and, and move through uh, some of the highlights of the Old Testament and then ultimately through the New Testament. And that will run to about 15 episodes as well. So I'm thinking about that, and that's probably what we'll do. But it's good to have you with, with me today for the uh, study in the uh, third chapter of the book of Colossians. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that we are spared to this moment and can have this opportunity to open your word and to talk about the great things that are there. And as we uh, go through the latter part of the book of uh, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, we ask for insight, and we ask you to give us wisdom, guide us that we may study to show ourselves approved and that we may please you and glorify your name in all the earth. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The last time when we uh, ended, we had been uh, talking about the third chapter of Colossians, verses 1 through 4. And we had connected that with the second chapter where Paul had been talking about the uh, uh, circumcision of the new covenant, the symbol of the new covenant, which is circumcision not made with hands, but is uh, a circumcision that excises the sin from the soul, in the sacrifice of the, of the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And that uh, was, uh, Paul identified that as bury, being buried with Christ in baptism and, uh, and to be raised with him. And uh, when we got to the third chapter then, it begins, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek those things that are above where Christ is, the right hand of God. Uh, don't put your heart on things upon the earth, but... Uh, put your heart on things where Christ is, for you're, you died to sin, and you are now hidden with Christ in God. And uh, we talked about, as we, uh, time ended, that uh, if we are in Christ and he is with God, spiritually speaking, our spirit life is tied to God in heaven now through uh, the possession of our soul by Jesus and through his intermediaryship as the high priest in the new covenant. We want to continue today then in the third chapter. Uh, we'll continue with verse 5, and uh, hopefully we'll get through verse 11. Uh, there, this material divides up, and it's kind of uh, lengthy, and if uh, I think we, uh, I've run out of time and you don't want to sit any longer, I may just stop and start next time. But let's read uh, from Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and then we'll pick up at verse 5. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then we come to verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge uh, after the image uh, of its creator. Here, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, that's the law of uh, circumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all uh, and in all. 
Now then, we won't stop there because this is the negative side of Paul speaking about the, the result that ought to happen if we have been raised with Christ. And uh, the latter half of this is the positive things that uh, should be going on for, with those who have been raised with Christ. But there is a therefore, and so we have therefore uh, again. You probably say, uh, we're about out, therefore out, Bob, but uh, just to refresh, the context is the text just before the text that we are studying, and the context is the text just after the text that we're studying. And uh, I've said, that this is probably the third or fourth time, that it's very important to keep the text that we're study, studying located in its context. And uh, quoted that uh, great preacher that said, any text can be taken out of context and made a pretext for almost anything. So we want to be very mindful of our context. And it's important to keep this uh, in the context of, of the Scripture. So we could get to verse 5, and uh, they, there's a shift. Um, I call this the radical shift of Christianity. What happens to those who have been raised with Christ from baptism as they put off their old life and put on their new life, that is, uh, the life given to the Christians who are baptized into Christ as they come up out of the watery grave of baptism. So in light of all that has been said about the importance of being raised with Christ, uh, what uh, we could say here is just a, a sort of a summary uh, of what has been made. So he says that in light of all that has been said about the importance uh, of being raised with Christ, what should be observable in our lives in the life of a person that has been raised with Christ? Paul responds, uh, to put to death the members of your earthly body. Uh, the language here is a very radical language. Uh, if the Greek were translated literally, it would be something like uh, murder, murder your old earthly life and existence. The word here is used for, in Greek, uh, for the assassination of someone or murder of some individual. The flesh is what is being assassinated and the dominance of the flesh by Satan in the war against our soul uh, is what is being excised in the new uh, concept of circumcision which is the being buried with Christ in baptism. So the source of all of the conflict then as it has always been is Satan. Paul's strong language is not an, uh, an accident, nor uh, is it an afterthought. It is a deliberate act of Paul through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so it's, uh, he's stating things in strong terms, violent terms, as a matter of fact. What we must be doing in the life that, uh, and activities that ought to be ours as, as we are now a new man in Christ Jesus. So seeking the things that are above where Christ is, uh, we have a battle uh, with the desires of the flesh because we still live in the body that is clothed in its flesh, but the spirit has been changed and has been separated from that sinful uh, apparatus by the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The apostle Peter makes this very clear when he says in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles uh, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. People who have been raised with Christ are just uh, temporary here. Uh, they're sojourners living in the world as exiles. Exiles from the true home of the soul where we are hidden with Christ in God if we seek the things that are above with him. And so the flesh uh, is not something that, that we should then live for. Don't live for the flesh, he is saying. Living in the world as sojourners is uh, uh, just a good de uh, definition of how we live in Christ once uh, he, we have been raised with him. Paul's also clear that the risen with Christ person has all the resources that Paul has stated that are in Christ Jesus. 
Uh, but there's still this battle that goes on in our flesh. Paul speaks of it in another place, of it warring against the soul. And so we have to hold our flesh and the temptation of Satan and even Satan himself at bay. Now, Peter describes Satan or the devil in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 in these words, be sober-minded, and be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The battle that the risen with Christ people have is with worldliness, Satan's domain of the sinful world. And it's real. And the battle that we have with Satan is a soul-crushing brutality. And it is worldwide, as is also the solution, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul admonishes uh, to make every effort to live with and to live for Jesus. And he couches his words in strong language. Then secondly, uh, uh, there are two reasons why Paul uses such strong language here. The first one is uh, that uh, the temptation that comes by way of flesh. Uh, the brutality of Satan must be met with strong force. Now the strongest force in the world uh, that, uh, that drives Satan away is the presence of God in our lives through Jesus Christ. Uh, in another passage, uh, one of the writers will say that uh, come near to God and Satan will flee from you. And so we are told, as we've seen from First Peter uh, chapter 5, to resist him in our faith. So the first uh, reason Paul uses this strong language uh, is that the temptation that comes by way of Satan's uh, uh, tempting through our flesh that has been killed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, Paul has gone into detail earlier in this letter to emphasize that the great area of their temptation uh, to the, the, Colossian brethren, the Colossian brethren and to all of us who follow in their footsteps uh, would rise from our fleshly nature. Now there's a difference between what the Bible means by the flesh, fleshly nature and our body of flesh, although they are uh, connected in, in in various ways, but he uh, Paul points out that God has done a radical thing in providing for the forgiveness of sins. It is radical to take a part of the Godhead and put Him into the earth and let the fullness of the Godhead dwell in Him bodily. Uh, put Him here amidst the uh, trials and tribulations and the temptations of Satan with other people in a human body wherein he could have sinned, but didn't. And then at the end of that life, take the blood, the sinless blood of a sinless life as a sacrifice, a propitiation offering for the sin of all the world. That's, that's pretty radical. And Jesus uh, willingly, according to the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, uh, emptied himself willingly and left heaven uh, to dwell among the human race and to carry in his body the consequence of sin uh, to the cross, the altar on which he was sacrificed for sin. <clears throat> and so in, in that way then we have this new covenant that Paul has spoken of. Uh, the Old Testament, the law of Moses covenant, and the symbol of that, as we have seen, is physical circumcision of uh, every male child at uh, the age of eight days. Now, however, uh, the flesh of the sin has been cleansed and excised by the dying of our body, of the body of the flesh of Jesus, and the providing of the new concept of what, con what circumcision is uh, in the waters of baptism. And Jesus is indeed the incarnate Son of God. He is fully in a, a God in a fully fleshly body uh, of human flesh. Um, human sin first entered into the world, uh, into the human experience, that is to say, uh, in the initial uh, sinfulness, 
by or through a human body of Adam and Eve. And in that body of their flesh, then sin entered the world. Jesus entered, the, entered into the world as the babe of Bethlehem and lived in that fleshly body that he could have sinned, but he did no sin, as I have said. When he died, in his body of flesh, it was a representative death. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but Jesus' death represents every human being that has ever lived uh, in this world, is living now, or shall live until Jesus comes and puts the period to the sentence of history. And Jesus uh, is, a, is the representative of sinful humanity. And he became that because he left his place in heaven and came in the body of the babe of Bethlehem, Mary's baby. And when he grew up to begin his ministry, he was anointed to his ministry by being baptized by John the Baptist. And then for about, for about three years, he did the ministry of reconciliation here upon the earth as God in the flesh. I can't explain the carnation, but uh, I know what the word means and I uh, accept by faith what God has done in Jesus Christ to, to save us from sin. So that's the first reason the, for Paul's strong radical language is that uh, it represents the radical action of God in letting his son die uh, after he had lived a sinless life, die for all the sinners of the world. And all who will come to God through and in Jesus Christ will then be refreshed in their spirit, have the sin of their soul excised, and have their hearts with Jesus, with God in heaven, with the hope of going there, really, to live without end in eternity. Now, the second reason uh, for why Paul uses such strong language is that uh, they themselves and us who have been baptized into Christ um, have been raised with Christ uh, uh, from the grave of baptism. And this, uh, in this way, the blood of Jesus Christ takes away all sin, 1 John 1, 7. And uh, there, it is a kind of exciting, uh, excitement. It removes the guilt of sin and the reality of sin from our spiritual nature, from our lives. Uh, in looking at the things in Revelation about how beautiful heaven must be, one is impressed that there is no sin there. It is beautiful because it's totally holiness. The holiness of God breached by sin in the Garden of Eden has been rectified, and the access to the tree of life whether symbolically or in actuality, has been restored uh, to humanity and can be accessed by all those who come to God by the means of the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, so because they've been raised, Paul, and it, it's a very radical experience that, uh, that made it possible, Paul speaks in terms of a very radical thing. And so we have a, a, a circumcision, to repeat, that's not made with hands, and it's eternal in the heaven. And Paul says here that it is by the working of, the God, of God, the working of the action of God's grace that ex exercises his mercy, and in the uh, satisfaction of the blood of Jesus for the wrath of God towards human sin, then we have access uh, to the presence of God and shall have all into eternity in eternal life. Uh, they, those then that he is writing to, as well as to us who now read it, uh, have been ra uh, raised with Christ to these great blessings, and it has been a violent means by which God was able to achieve uh, that reconciliation of humanity to himself. God isn't reconciled to us. He hasn't gone anywhere. But we have, and we are reconciled to him in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so those uh, who have been raised with Christ now sustain a different relationship and a new place in the world, in the place that God has given them. 
and uh, and they now belong to God in Christ, who is uh, hidden with Christ in heaven. They have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness uh, uh, into the kingdom of Christ, as we noted earlier in what Paul had to say about that in the, in this letter. So now they must live in Christ. If we understand the things up to this point about the importance of being raised with Christ, then there is a switch, a radical change here in the in the fifth verse of Ephesians of Colossians chapter three. So now they must. Uh, Paul talks to them about how they can are to live if they're to, going to live uh, in the sinless flesh in Jesus Christ, and not the way, uh, not to the way of the world. Uh, they died to sin. If you have been buried with Christ in baptism and and, uh, or a child of God through him, uh, you have died to sin. You don't love the world as you once lived for it. And uh, the the, uh, lust of the flesh is uh, canceled by the hope and this bubbling of the spirit of eternal life. They are now, Paul says, living in the light of God. We noticed earlier, and we've noticed again, and now we notice once more, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, where John says, This has been the message from the beginning. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. John must surely be referring to the fact that God is light, like God is love, and some other things. But when he created the universe through the instrumentality of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, it was uh, without form and void, we're told in Genesis, Genesis 1, and it was the darkness was stalking upon the face of the waters. And the first act that God did after he had created from nothing the existence of the, of the universe now, the first thing God said, let there be light. John says from the very beginning, that's the message, God is the light of this world, Jesus is the light of this world through him. And so uh, they're living in the light that God is. And uh, he, Paul, is writing to them about the fact of being hidden with Christ in God. Uh, They have been excised by the light of the world from the darkness of the sin that stalks the bodies and the lives of every human being that is in the world uh, who has not been saved by the a circumcision of Christ, which is the a, ba- a circumcision not made with hands, and it is the symbol, which is baptism by immersion. And they're hidden with, with Christ in God, and they must seek that which is above, and uh, Paul uses this radical language uh, uh, to uh, describe that. But we remember that those who have been raised with Christ uh, from baptism and have been excised in the, from the flesh in their sin Uh, by the circumcision of Jesus in baptism, thus the radical control of oneself is expected. Uh, It's expected in in Christ as being necessary. We have been saved, if we're in Christ, from the power of sin, power of Satan. But he hasn't given up on you and me. Uh, There is still going to be a fight with the uh, mundane things of this life, the things of the world that are contradictory to the spiritual life that Christ has provided for us uh, in Jesus Christ. And so a radical control of our lives, of our beings, uh, is necessary. And thus Paul, using his strong languages, uh, is, uh, uh, gives us a reminder that we've been raised to Jesus in a new way, to a new life. But we still live in this world, and we must fight the fight of the faithful and to be radically controlling by the power of the Spirit and the indwelling of Jesus uh, of of the human flesh. Paul is stating in strong, violent terms that what we must do uh, with the life that now we have uh, as we live in the activities of the ongoing uh, control of the world by, by the flesh, our earthly, fleshly nature. So he tells us what to do with it. 
how to control it. What he says is, murder it. Your earthly, physical, I mean, the fleshly nature, it dies when we can become Christians and become washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the thing that we strive to do then is to keep it there in its uh, departed place. So uh, Paul is stating strong language in violent terms that we must do this if we're going to walk with the Lord and walk faithfully uh, in keeping with the excising of uh, sin from our souls uh, by the sacrifice of the body of Christ. So seeking the things that are above where Christ is, we have this battle with the desires of the flesh. And uh, it demands vigilance on our parts. Again, the Apostle Peter addresses this same a subject. He makes it clear that the adversary will be active in opposition to the righteousness and the cause of him who raised us from the dead. Peter said in in uh, uh, First Peter uh, two or Second Peter two one and three that in the olden day false prophets. Uh, arose among the people, just as there will be a false prophets among you. He could have been referring to Gnosticism or the Judaizing teachers, and who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and may be, may, uh, many will follow the sensuality and because uh, of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in, the, in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Strong language, and, and in some ways, a very frightening thought, if we are not uh, uh, in the care and keeping of him who is in the presence of God, by our soul being incorporated into him. Paul, so Paul is also quite clear that the risen, uh, the people risen with Christ, the risen with Christ person, has all the resources that Paul uh, has stated. Still there is this body of, of the flesh, and the devil uh, must be kept at bay, and we are to make every, every effort uh, to uh, keep ourselves uh, free and uh, committed uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, the third point I wanted to make at this juncture, at this juncture, Paul speaks uh, in specifics. He talks about some things that are specifically, radically wrong in this world and that are a part of the lives of those who have not... Uh, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, as to use the language of the book of Revelation. Paul catalogs works of the flesh. He declares, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. That is an intriguing sentence. That which is earthly. Well, our bodies uh, originated in Adam from the earth. And uh, we know that the Bible teaches that they are going back to the earth to decay again when we die in this body on the earth. But at any rate, uh, earthly things uh, have an appeal even to those whose souls have been cleansed by ad ad addressing that through the sacrifice of Jesus. Peter describes what is to happen to the earthly things on the day of the Lord, that's the second coming of Christ, that is described in uh, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Hear what the text has to say. The Lord, day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a ro uh, roar, and the heavenly bodies will be found burned up and dissolved, and the earth will be, uh, and the works that are therein, that are done on it will be exposed or burned up, Second Peter 3.10. Paul wants uh, the Colossians and those who follow in their train, us, uh, to know some things specifically that are not to be in our lives. And uh, so uh, he takes the time to go into detail. He lists those things that 
we ought to murder, kill the works of the flesh, the first one listed is immorality. Immorality. Impurity, which immorality brings to the lives of merciful, uh, merciful, sinful people. So uh, immorality, that which is immoral. I sometimes uh, would joke with my students at school, they're so young, as I grew older, and uh, something would come up that we'd laugh about that between the a difference of the ages, and I'd say, you you young people are so immorally young. <laughs> well, they'd laugh at that. So young to be immoral. Well, they knew I was joking, and that uh, most of them are very pure. But immorality, it could include a number of things. Uh, primarily, we think in terms of sexuality, and the abuse of it as far as purity is concerned, that the immoral things that can be done uh, such as uh, uh, sex tra uh, trafficking and uh, all of that that is uh, uh, plaguing the world again at this time as uh, young women are, are abducted and sold into uh, prostitution. Uh, that's immoral. Uh, it's uh, something that Christians will put away from them. They'll kill the immoral impulses that the body brings against the spirit. And Paul says the body is, be, is at war with the spirit. Immorality takes all kinds of forms, and the sexual aspect of it uh, has in our day, in this very day and time, gone to the extremes at which caused God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Paul says right here, the first thing on the list, that, that those who are buried with Christ and risen with him should do is to put to death immor the immoral impulses that people, all of us have capability of in our soul. And so uh, immorality, the second thing he lists specifically, is impurity. That would reach uh, to a lot more than immorality would, impurity. There are a lot of ways to be impure, not just sexually, but in many other ways. And Paul says, uh, and when we become people who have been risen with Christ, then we put away the immoral thoughts and the immoral activities and the impurities that stem from all of those kinds of things. And then the word passion, put to death passion. Now, we use passion in two ways. Sometimes we refer to a young man that's... Uh, uh, preaching as he has a passion for preaching. Paul isn't talking about that kind of passion. Uh, he is talking about the passion of lust that underlies impurity and immortal, Im immorality. And so that that kind of uh, uh, passion for uh, the satisfying of the thirst of things that will destroy the soul and the hunger of the flesh that wars against the soul, that passion. With it, he then uses the term evil desires. And so you see, we have a cluster of concepts that fit into a one bag of total sinfulness. Evil desires uh, that uh, would not be just uh, in the thoughts of uh, immoral sexuality, an evil desire uh, might be to own what somebody else has. Uh, and that will be included in the next word, of course. But uh, those evil desires that come to the hearts and minds of people that have not been raised with Christ and tempt the people who have been raised with Christ are the works of the devil. And uh, Paul is saying, when you have been raised with Christ, then you need to be uh, vigilant to keep those things killed uh, in your heart and mind who, and soul which has been saved uh, by the excising of your sin in the uh, circumcision of Christ. And then the uh, fifth thing that he says uh, uh, to put to death is agreed. And it's interesting, isn't it, that he adds an afterthought to greed. And he said that is actually idolatry. Greed leads to idolatry. We can, we can see the logic of that statement, can't we? 
that if we want more than we uh, need and more than we ought to have and we are so greedy to get someone else's stuff and we begin to worship the things that we have, greed that worships uh, possessions. Uh, one of the great uh, crazies of fads that's going on as I speak is the resurgence of the fad of uh, fountain pens, ink pens. Well, people went for years without even seeing one. I've had one since I was in the sixth grade. And I write with the one that I had all the way, all the way through college. I never stopped writing with pen and ink, but I do have used a lot of, of ballpoint pens, and I, I really like to write with pencils, too. But right now on Facebook, you can find a half a dozen different uh, uh, people uh, trying to sell you all kinds of fountain pens. I noticed the other day that uh, somebody had one for sale for $1,000. That sounds kind of greedy to me. Now, I have several fountain pens, but uh, if the Lord comes tonight, I'll be glad to leave them. And anything else that we have on earth, if we become greedy for it and worship it, then we have dethroned the one who ought to be sitting on the throne of our heart of worship. Idolatry uh, is a fearsome thing, and God has always uh, abhorred it and destroyed it. The first time I ever saw people actually bowing down to an idol and worshiping it, I was 19 years old, had just gotten off a troop ship at the island of Okinawa during the height of the Korean War, and as we came up from the beach in those big six-by trucks riding on the back of them, on either side of the road, as far as almost we could see, were burial grounds. People out there bringing food to the tombs of their ancestors. People out there praising their ancestors and worshiping an idol that was made of stone. It was all over the place. And it cut me to the heart and core. It is the motivation behind which I sit before this microphone and camera and try to preach the gospel today. Idolatry is the thing most hated by God because, in a sense, idolatry incorporates all the sin and the beginning of sin. Uh, idolatry, the concept of it, was in the temptation that uh, Eve succumbed to in the Garden of Eden that she might have that which would take her from the worship of God. And anything that does that, my friends, is, an, is idolatry. But then these things, Paul goes on to say, uh, are the objects of the wrath of God. Specifically, the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Uh, that could indicate servants of the devil. It could mean those who turn back uh, from their becoming uh, children of God, from be people who have been at one time hidden with Christ and God and then have left Christ and gone back uh, into the sinfulness of the world. Uh, people who now live the risen with Christ life once walked in those things, Paul says. When they were living in those things, they were walking in those things, and they were without hope and without God in the world, Paul says in another place. But now, but now, Paul declares what a change life should look like. If then you've been raised with Christ, put to death all of those things. And, and so Paul uh, begins to talk about some things, and we'll talk about it later, about uh, what a, a life of one who's been raised with Christ uh, should look like. The new life in Christ requires uh, those who have been raised with Christ to live as new creatures. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, hidden with Christ in God, in Christ, uh, he is a new creature or a new creation. He has been recreated like in born again. They are to put aside the common traits of the unraised ones. Now, We've gone through one list, but Paul's getting ready to give another list. And these are, these are different from what we have just been talking about. Uh, the unraised ones uh, are with uncircumcised hearts. And this list of specifics 
uh, could be called the socially acceptable sins. Paul says anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. We see it every day. Those are, those are accepted socially in the world around us. Sadly, it is a great temptation for those who have been raised with Christ, Christians, to be tempted to enter those things and to use some of those things again. Christianity has always been, the, the uh, uh, relationship of God's people has always been countercultural. Uh, the culture of the world, uh, the worldliness of the world is controlled uh, by the prince of the power of the air, as Paul calls Satan in another place. And so Paul says, you need to put these things from you. Uh, anger. Was it wrong to become angry? Uh, we use the term mad. Uh, what we, when we mean anger, dogs get mad, people become angry. Anger. Is there such a thing as righteous anger? Well, most scholars believe that when Jesus purged the temple uh, in Jerusalem, that it was a form of righteous indignation. What is righteous indignation? Well, it is something that the Son of God can do, but we need to be very, very careful about the followers of the Son of God exercising that as an option. We need to learn to control our anger. Angry, becoming angry and shouting at the referee and cursing out the the bus driver or whoever runs in front of you in line at Walmart, always being mad as dogs at somebody or about something, not ever being pleased or satisfied, but always finding fault and being angry at the least little thing. Christians must not allow that to become their personality. Paul says these things God requires to be put aside as new creatures. Anger, which leads uh, to wrath. The wrath of God is coming upon these things, Paul says. And uh, the wrath of God has now been propitiated, that is, uh, hidden from view, so that uh, his wrath uh, ha has been satisfied in the blood of Jesus. But wrath is a terrible kind of disposition that takes a gun and shoots a wife and all the children are... Uh, gets angry with a, may, a, a neighbor over uh, where the property line between property is and runs in the house and gets his pistol and in the wrath of that angrous cause shoots him. Anger and wrath are twin brothers. They're the same, uh, they're the two sides of the same coin and comes from the malice. Paul says uh, we, we can't hold malice in our heart. Malice is like a grudge. Get even. Oh, we want to get even? Paul, or the writer of the Hebrew letter, says in the 10th chapter, God says, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine. We don't have permission and right from God to get revenge. And uh, a, a psychologist friend that I know love and been friends of a long time uh, says that uh, uh, people who hold grudges and try to wait to get revenge damage themselves more than the person that they may finally get revenge upon destroys something deep in the heart of our psychic it keeps our mind and brain in a role of turmoil and it all goes together with anger that's uh, that is kept in the heart that becomes malice. And so that naturally coming out of that would be slander. A slander is to destroy the reputation and the good name of somebody. And incorporated into the concept of slander is the term that we know as gossip. That uh, we uh, talk about people behind their back and the act before their face that we uh, agree with them exactly when we've been gossiping about them or to know something about somebody that is very little known or not known by anybody else that would be better 
kept than told and gossip does it. I don't know if I have time to tell you this little story, but my students will tell you I did some of these things anyway. So I heard a story one time, this was a preacher story, about some preachers that were all gathered together at a, at a luncheon, and they got to talking. A few of them that were left after it was over said, you know, we don't have a preacher to tell our troubles to. And so one of them said, well, why don't we just uh, share our troubles with each other and help each other? And one said, well, okay, I'll, I'll start. So I, I, I tend to be an alcoholic, and I, want, I would like to curb my alcoholism, and I, I hope that you fellows will help me. And another one said, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a kleptomaniac. I, I steal a lot of things. And I, I wish I could uh, get, get to over that. You all help me. And there's one fellow over there, that, uh, maybe that was James Wall. He was uh, quiet and didn't ever say anything. And uh, they said, well, don't you have something? He said, yes, I'm a gossip, but I can't hardly wait to get out of here. Slander has broken the hearts and lives Gossip, that old insidious nature to get it told, has hurt more people than even the world can count. So then added to that is the abusive speech. Oh, a little cussing won't hurt anybody. Oh, you know, a few words here and there, maybe a vulgar one or two, maybe a dirty joke. Uh, abusive speech that also abuses people but abusive speech that is profanity. I've known in my time, having spent four years in the Air Force and worked uh, sometimes in uh, the secular world, uh, here and there a few people that couldn't hardly talk without, that without saying a curse word. I mean, it was just over and over and over. That was one of the reasons I was glad to get married and get out of the barracks. I didn't have to hear that stuff every day all night long. These things are the socially accepted sins, however. They're not like the ones that we talked about uh, earlier in Paul's list, immorality and impurity, uh, passion, evil desire, and greed. No, these are ones that people are likely to do and uh, be pre perfectly socially acceptable, at least up to a point. But Paul doesn't know anything about a socially acceptable sin. These sins do damage to people constantly, every day, over and over and over, both publicly and in privately, sometimes even unconsciously. And so these are not the sins that are okay for Christians to do, because there are none like that. However, the risen Christ person, the risen with Christ person, needs to take note that these may be acceptable socially in the world, but they are not acceptable with our Lord. He has excised us from this kind of conduct, and uh, the lives of those who are hidden with Christ in God should beware of being accepted, acceptable in these things by the culture, which is so antagonistic to the things loved by those who are to inherit with the saints in light, as we studied in another lesson. And then Paul says, furthermore, do not lie one to another. Now we had a list of terrible sinfulness. We had a list of, of sinful things that are sometimes people accept, and a lie covers both of them. The Holy Spirit saw fit to separate it to itself as the taboo of humanity. Do not lie one to another. The, uh, the Bible in the book of Revelation says God hates those who, who are liars. And he, because Satan is the inventor of the lie. Well, yes, in the Garden of Eden, he told the first lie and, and he believed it. If we have a life in Christ, that life in Christ requires us to do everything we can to be deadly honest. Integrity is the sterling quality of an honest character. Integrity is the thing that is most sought by those who know the right thing in this world in which we live. 
So, Paul said, you've laid aside the old self and all those evil practices, including the socially acceptable ones, and now you've put on a new self, as he says in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5, 17. And that uh, those who have been raised with Christ have a new knowledge and a new re relationship. And uh, they were made in, uh, created in the image of God in the beginning, and now we've been recreated in the image of Christ in the excising of his circumcision of the flesh. Don't lie. Paul says, do not lie to one another. That's the work of the devil. Honestly is a trait that is a hallmark of what Christianity really is. Integrity. Honesty. Honesty in all things. Honesty before watch a, a watching world, watching to see if we who have been raised to give of the Christ will be that way. Above all, honesty between brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought not ever to do all the other things to our brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we should not lie about them, or lie to them, or lie on them. The oneness of the body depends upon the integrity of honesty in the hearts and the active lives of participating Christians. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 8, that, that finally all of you have a unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to the for to do this you are were called to bless, you were to call that you may attain a blessing. Noah was given about six things of God. God only required one thing of Noah, and that was to be a blessing. We will be a blessing if because we have been raised with Christ are now hidden with him in God. We be honest and we put off the old man and that we put on the new person of which we shall speak in our next episode. God bless you and keep you and thank you for being with us. Music